Welcome to this Cape Advanced Technology Lecture. And we're very delighted to have one of our own academic, Dr. Tenlong, to give a talk. Dr. Tenlong has been appointed lecturer at the University of Cambridge in 2016. Gosh, it's been five years now. He established the Applied Power Electronics Laboratory, the Long Group, and he's currently leading a research team comprised of three postdoc research associates and eight PhD students. His research portfolio covers from power electronic devices to power converters to drive and power systems, mainly for transport, electrification, and renewable energy amplification. Since his lectureship, Dr. Long has been awarded more than 2.5 million pounds research grants, where half are funded by the UK government and the rest directly from the industrial sponsors. Dr. Long has built a strong connections with industrial partners, including the SAIC Motor, Dynex Semiconductors, Dynex Semiconductors, and STM, ST Microelectronics, Siemens, CBMM, CRRC, Wuxi SES, Huawei, NIO, etc. Prior to joining Cambridge, he has worked for General Electric GE, where he has led or played an important role in many rewarding projects, such as the first transformerless or electric oil platform supply vessel, and the first large scale or electric warship, Type 45 destroyer, and the first electromagnetic aircraft capsule demonstrator. To date, Dr. Long has more than 40 academic papers published at international journals, and he is the inventor of five international patents. Dr. Long received BNG from the Harding University of Science and Technology in China, and the first class BNG owners from the University of Birmingham, UK in 2009. And he received his PhD from University of Cambridge in 2013. Dr. Long is a chartered engineer registered with the UK Engineering Council. The title of his talk today is Power Electronics in Energy Conversion. Dr. Long. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your very generous introduction. So let me just share my, uh, share my screen. Just one second. And then we can uh, start. So, here we go. We can share. Right, let's go back to the start. Yeah, it's coming through. Good. Right, okay. Um, let's do this. Right, thank you. Thank you, Daping, for a very generous introduction for myself. And uh, thank you, very, everyone, for this uh, CAPE lecture. I really appreciate CAPE's uh, sponsorship to some of our projects and uh, uh, really great. Uh, organization to build uh, collaboration between academic and uh, industry. Uh, so my title, the power trials in power conversion is actually quite broad. So uh, uh, it, it will be very greedy for me to give both um, depth and coverage of my re of, about my research within 45 minutes. So I decide to give it more uh, broadness rather than uh, in-depth uh, technology. So hopefully it won't disappoint you. Uh, and hopefully that can be more suitable for this very uh, general uh, audience. So the outlines of my, uh, my talk. So I'll firstly start with something about the uh, white band gap power electronic devices, uh, and especially their applications in convert. And we talk about the converter packaging rather than power module packaging, because we believe that has uh, more potentials. And then we will start uh, more about applications. Uh, we start from the transport electrification, Polytronics plays a very important role in the uh, transport electrification. 
And then uh, I will uh, also give you some uh, a brief introduction about the, the work we have been uh, working on the high power wireless power transfer. Uh, and some applications could also be electrical vehicle charging, for example. And finally, I will also uh, quite uh, briefly mention some uh, ongoing projects we are uh, working with one member of the CAPE, uh, which is the uh, uh, DC, uh, 48 DC power supplies for the data center applications. Uh, okay, so let's start from something uh, quite entry level, or quite fundamental uh, uh, theory about the uh, wideband gap power devices. So, so what power devices for us, basically they're just like switches, uh, no different to some mechanical switches. Um, what we do, we need to switch such uh, power electronic devices uh, very fast. So let me just have that basic point. So we, we talk about like 10,000 or 100,000 per second. So it's very high frequency switching. And we also want them to become uh, quite efficient. So we want to have lower loss. And one particular thing is we want to have like have lower conduction loss. So when they switch on, the uh, uh, the conduction or the re internal resistance can be as low as possible, hopefully. So yeah, basically we have switches, can be silicon IGBTs, can be silicon or thin carbon MOSFETs, uh, two very typical power devices we use. And some of the materials, conversion with silicon uh, is normal uh, semiconductors. And so-called white band gap, uh, one kind of very, brutally simple way to explain this is you have high web, uh, high band gaps and you can have higher uh, breakdown voltage. Uh, so in, to interpret that, that means if you, if you have the same hold up voltage, the material we use for silicon wide band gap material like gallium nitride or silicon carbide or even more extreme like diamond, you will use much less materials. And that will bring many benefits. Uh, one benefit is, especially for the MOSFET structure of power electronic devices, uh, we will have less material we need uh, to, uh, to block the same uh, voltage. So less material we use, that means the internal resistance will be smaller, and that means the conduction loss can be reduced. So that's a very obvious advantage we have. We have lower conduction loss from the web and gap devices. And the other advantage we have is also thanks to the silicon carbide MOSFET. The MOSFET structure is the switching loss can be much reduced. So what is the switching loss? So also in a very brutally simple way to explain this, when we switch on or switch off, like on close the circuit, off is open the circuit, we'll have the uh, volt, like switching on, have the voltage reduced, have kind of switching on the voltage across the device will become zero and the current will build up. And they will have some overlap between the voltage and current. And this overlap is a switching energy. So that switching energy times switching frequency becomes our switching loss. So it's quite obvious we want to have smaller switching energy and then we can have smaller switching loss. Uh, silicon carbon MOSFET uh, in particular can have very fast switching. That means the changing of the current and voltage can be much faster than the same rating of the silicon IGBTs. Uh, so that means switching energy can be, can be reduced. And same, uh, similar, but even more dr dramatically better is switching off. Uh, the IGBT as the bipolar device has a uh, much larger switching off energy, but silicon carbon MOSFET can switch off very fast, so the switching off energy can be much smaller. So, so that switching loss reduction and the conduction loss reduction is actually the main benefit uh, I would say uh, both from the wide band gap devices, especially now we talk about silicon carbon and gallium nitride. Diamonds, maybe in the future, but uh, still need some time. Right, okay, so, so that is the fantastic properties we have from such semiconductors. But when we use them, uh, we need to consider the whole system and some uh, design will actually compromise such advantage from semiconductors. So for example, we have this half bridge where we have high side and low side uh, power MOSFETs. It's a typical building block for power converters. And inevitably you will have some three inductance. Uh, when we have conductor, conductor will have some parasitic inductance. That's something you can't, you cannot completely avoid it, but you can try to reduce them. The problem is this three inductance, this parasitic inductance will slow down the current. So even your semiconductor, can switch very fast, 
but the three inductors will slow down them, so the uh, switch energy will be uh, increased. So that's actually a trade-off of uh, the, uh, adva uh, the advanced power semiconductors. Uh, give one example. So this is a power module from a Japanese company called Ron, and they used a flat pack uh, module where you can see there are many uh, uh, small chips, which is a silicon carbide uh, power semiconductors. Uh, interesting enough, they use the same arrangement, or almost same arrangement, and same uh, module for the silicon ITBTs. So they didn't change the, the, the layout of the module, but they only changed the uh, semiconductors. And then what happened is, if you look at the loop of, uh, sorry, if you, if, you, if you look at the loop of this, uh, I think it's a bit slow on my, on my PC when I do in Zoom. Um, anyway, um, I tried to use my laser point, but it's, it's, it's folding that as there. Okay, here, here we go. So the loop here between the DC positive and DC negative, which is terminal uh, terminals defined by its module, uh, as you can see, is quite significant, and that will bring quite large string inductance. We calculate that and also test it about 35 to 900, which is actually very, 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 very large string inductance. For the silicon IGBTs, because they switch slow, so string inductance is not really big deal, so they less worry about them, but not for silicon carbon MOSFET. So if we still use the carbon MOS, still use this package, but for silicon carbon MOSFET, the advantage of silicon carbon MOSFET will be completely uh, a trade-off. So, um, so you, you will not see that advantage. Uh, and what we have done, say, we're not using that um, power module. Instead, we use the discrete uh, silicon carbon MOSFET, so the bit different package. Uh, I think my computer is frozen again. Uh, sorry, sorry for that. Uh, some pictures here are quite large, so that couldn't be too much. I'm just go back. Here we go. So, um, as you can see, we have here the green and the south of each device is aligned. Uh, it, it, it's in a line, and then the AC is in the midpoint. So we change the lateral loop to a vertical loop, and the uh, power semiconductors they are very. Uh, thin. So uh, the vertical loop will reduce the whole length of the loop, so the string inductance can be much reduced. And this is actually still very incremental uh, 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 progress we made because we still rely on these uh, devices. But uh, this, 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 this discrete device uh, package uh, is something we can buy from the market quite easily. And we build a 180 kilowatts in carbon EV traction inverter uh, from one uh, sponsored project. Uh, and we would like to first say if we use this discrete silicon carbide package, uh, which is available from the market, how much advantage we can actually cash in from silicon carbide devices. And we build this, uh, this uh, um, uh, very high power traction inverter, uh, which offers us quite high power density. And more importantly, the stream inductance have been reduced to uh, less than 11 nanohenry. Before, like the commercial power modules or something more than 35 nanohenry, but now we, we are less than a third of it. So that can massively increase the switching speed and all this uh, advantage of silicon carbide uh, MOSFET can be utilized. But as I said, it's still very incremental. So don't we think something more fun? Like we can. Uh, sorry. So don't we think something more fundamental? Like can we actually further unlock the full potentials of the uh, MOSFET. So when we start thinking about what actually the converter is, what actual the traction inverter, con uh, DC converter, all these polytronic apparatus, what they are built from. So basically you have frame, you hold everything, and silicon or silicon carbides, power semiconductors, some controllers, um, PCB, some ICs, integrated circuits, uh, passive components and then all the terminals. So that are the building uh, parts of a converter. And now we look at within each of this building block, what they are formed from. So let's start from the polytronic modules. We have semi semiconductor dies. That's actually the functional part uh, as the power semiconductor switch. 
And then we have the substring DBC of a bundle of a housing frame. Basically, those things are just to hold these devices, have server conductivity, and then to link all the devices together. So basically, they are doing conduction, uh, sorry, connection and thermal, uh, uh, thermal conduction. And look, look at the control. So basically, they use uh, PCBs uh, for the, all the circuitry and the uh, integrated circuit for the control, some other passive components. Similarly, we look at the passive components, uh, big passive com components like uh, the DC capacitor. We also have the frame, have the capacitor cell which is for the function as capacitor. And the uh, bus bar, no matter DC or AC bus bar, basically they are conducting uh, uh, parts. And then you have the heat sink, normally part of the whole frame. But if you look at this, the, a lot of things that actually they are excessive. We don't need them. So let's say we have polytronics module. As a module, as a separate or independent product, you need a substrate in the boundary, in the you know, frame. But when we build them into a converter, those things can be combined with other part of your converter. So then we break down all these uh, small parts of this uh, uh, of, of individual components and recombine some excessive components to, uh, to smaller uh, number of parts, then we actually can group only into two different categories. One is the device the, for the functions, uh, either for the control or for the power switching or for some under storage like the capacitor cells, the passive components. And then the rest is just for, substrate, uh, for substrating and connecting. So basically just hold out all the things connect all the things and spread heat. So with this kind of principle, then we break all these borders between the conventional uh, components and to, uh, to, to fully integrate the whole converter only depends on their main purposes. And we build that. So what we do is that we directly apply the power semiconductor die into our uh, uh, PCBs, it's very specially designed PCB. And the, the gate drive is also integrated with the PCBs. There's no bundleware anymore because the PCB itself can do current conducting. So it's same function like bundleware and bundleware is not good. So uh, we can reduce bundleware. And also PCBs give us a lot of flexibilities to design the circuit with more complexity and uh, better performance. For example, we can properly design that current loop to reduce the string inductance. And this very one uh, has less than one nanohenry, which is also uh, uh, like 10 times uh, decrease of the, uh, uh, the one from the discrete devices. So it's the other uh, uh, big progress. Uh, and also, uh, for example, the heat sink. Uh, heat sink use uh, the thermal conductivity material like metal and conductor, like no matter, no matter your AC bus bar or DC bus bar, they also built from, made from uh, uh, metals. So they should, have, they should have the same function as thermal conductivity. So we use them as the heat spreader to replace the heat sink. And similar thing for the PCBs, because PCBs are very thin and you can have vias between the copper plane. So they can also be part of the uh, a heat sink. So eventually, we also create a double side cooling for the semiconductors. So, uh, so, 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 so this is kind of like one case to show we can integrate that from the original functions rather than uh, uh, constrained by the uh, existing borders of of such packages. And by the way, this uh, die is not like something very small. It's 98, uh, 90 amps uh, die. I think uh, I think that's 30 million. Thin carbide MOSFET is exactly very typical for the electrical vehicle applications. It's actually quite powerful, uh, powerful uh, module we have built, and we have did some, uh, we have done some uh, uh, pioneer test of that. So, for example, we completely removed the boundware of the silicon uh, or silicon carbide devices. Uh, we used PCB to replace them, and we built this uh, uh, this uh, special uh, rig to. Uh, to hold the very small sitting carbide dies to the uh, to substring PCBs. Uh, and then we're going to test the entire half bridge uh, shortly. 
So yes, bundleware is not very good and we can remove them. Uh, as you can see, the bundleware gives some little arc here. This little arc will introduce more string inductance and also they are not reliable, uh, they can break. So now we completely remove them. Um, and we have this very fast uh, uh, power converters and then we can switch them very fast so we can have very uh, fast increase on decrease of current. But how we prove that? You know, to measure very high speed current, changing speed current is actually very challenging, especially a very high current we talk about here. So we look at the probes from the market, uh, available from the market. Basically you can have like the three main types. Uh, whole in fact, uh, current probe, uh, very expensive. Um, very good one is about 100 megahertz bandwidth. And they are very good in terms of uh, galvanic isolation. So, uh, you, 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 you can have induced uh, uh, magnetic field to, 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 to measure the current, so nothing needs to be invaded on this uh, board. But the problem is such clamp is very big, so you possibly have to introduce some flying wire, which will give you some extra uh, string inductance, so that limits the, uh, the, uh, the usage of such probe for very high speed uh, application because high speed conviction would design the PCB in a very compact way. We're trying to reduce the length of the loop as much as possible. Uh, regards to coil, can be slightly smaller. Uh, you can see this one is particularly designed for some power semiconductors. Uh, uh, this is a TU247 package. Um, so that is kind of like a selling point to say we can measure something on a very small scale. Uh, and the bandwidth can be also a bit higher if you use better uh, integrators. Uh, but the problem is, um, regards to coil, uh, cannot measure any DC current, so it can only be AC current, so that also limits that. Uh, coaxial shunt is very popular uh, in the uh, last uh, several years, especially when we have the wideband gap devices that's switching very fast. Uh, the drawback of coaxial shunt is uh, it's an invasive method, so you have to introduce this into your loop to measure the current which could be sometimes a bit tedious. And also, uh, these need to be very well designed because you introduce this into your circuit, so you don't want this shunt to give you additional string inductance. But unfortunately, now this one uh, from a American company is, is kind of like dominant in the whole market. This little BNC type shunt costs about $450. Uh, I think it's, a, it's massively overpriced, uh, but by the way, it's not that good, something just over 300 megahertz, and they introduce more than 14 nano hungry into your loop. So if you measure something, you claim to have like one nano hungry loop, how you can prove that? You introduce 14 nano hungry already in the loop, so that's a problem. And to, to address the problem, we have our in-house design of the current probe. Uh, it's an active shunt, so it's not a coaxial shunt, but we use some uh, uh, some shunt resistors, properly designed shunt resistors with some active compensation. And that gave us uh, one gigahertz bandwidth. So we are able to measure very high speed, genuinely measure very high speed current. Uh, and as you can say, that is also compatible with this, uh, uh, this, this company's commercial product. So that means we can use that into some other boards which designed for such current probes. Uh, uh, without any problems so the compatibility is high. And because it's a very thin shape of this current probe, it can be also versatile to be connected on the PCB, also on the bus bar, inserted between the bus bars. Uh, and more importantly, we only introduce uh, 200 picohenry into the whole loop. So it will, it's not perfect, but it will, it will not uh, uh, cause any huge problems considering the uh, normally power a uh, loop induction is something about one nano hungry. So even the very good one. Right, okay, so that's, that's pretty much a uh, lot of what the uh, wide band devices at a bit lower level in terms of the integration of the high speed uh, devices. And now let's move on to some applications. So electrification, uh, electrification of transport is something I'm very interested in. Uh, I have this picture, it's, uh, uh, that, that one was taken in uh, 1880. Four, um, and that at that time uh, Nikola Tesla was about uh, 28 years old. So that is long before uh, Elon Musk's 
Tesla Motor uh, about a century before. So uh, one thing we want to say here is that electrical vehicle actually start before in internal combustion engine. It just not properly established because uh, lack of under storage like battery and lack of power electronics. That time there's no power electronics, but now we can use power electronics to make it better. So what is electrical vehicle? Very simple way to show the structure. It's very different to internal combustion engine based vehicle. We have battery as the storage, and then we have motor for the propulsion when you drive the car. The power electronic converter is to control the motor. We convert from the DC output of the battery to a variable frequency, variable voltage, AC to drive the AC motor. So that is a very simple way of power trials to explain the whole proportion of electric vehicle. It's actually quite a simple structure. And some other example to show you, uh, Nissan Leaf, uh, if you look at this uh, battery here, cable to this, uh, to this uh, uh, traction inverter, and under the traction inverter is the electrical motor. And one of my favorites is Tesla Model 3, also very simple structure, battery on the chassis, uh, and to use the uh, uh, smaller lithium battery cells, build a whole battery pack, a very economical way of doing that, and traction inverter, and also onboard charger. We also have some product on the onboard charger, but not, not going to talk about that today, uh, the electrical motor. So the whole structure of the, uh, of the uh, electric vehicles are quite simple. And what are the fundamental problems or what are the research uh, uh, questions we can, uh, we can work on to answer to help the whole industry to prove? Uh, one thing that we call it the sub-switching for the partial load. So what, what, what we find this is a challenge, what we find is a problem. So basically when we have an electric vehicle uh, or any vehicle, you don't really drive that all the time on the motorway. Uh, you don't really drive that all the time to climbing a hill. Uh, most of the time it's an urban transport. So you only use very partial, a fractional of the whole rating of the system. So normally when we say the few, uh, uh, the few, the few uh, economy of the vehicle is not for the full rating, it's for the uh, a certain operation profile like AEDC or WLTP. Uh, they give a certain profile of vehicle at different speed, different condition of the road, and to say what is the uh, profile. So we have a project sponsor, a, a big OEM, and they say uh, we have 180 kilowatt uh, drive, and that is for a particular vehicle. And that particular vehicle in the NEDC, which is a 20 minute, uh, so 1200 second, 20 minute, uh, profile at different speed, different top, you know, that's uh, defined for such type of vehicle. And we want to say what efficiency we can improve. And then we did some calculation, very simple calculation. We translate that speed and top into the three phase power of the inverter. And that's very surprisingly uh, uh, different to the rating. You see the, the inverter is a rating of 180 kilowatt. That is the possibly highest power that inverter uh, could have, uh, but most of the time you have only used less than a third of it. For all the safety reasons, you know, we have to rate this uh, inverter in a high rating, but probably that rating you only have that once in a whole lifetime of the vehicle. But, it, but that once of the whole life of the vehicle, you still need to achieve, right? So the whole converter still need to be 180 kilowatts. And we know we have high current or high power. We need high current. High current, we need more devices in parallel. Then there's a problem. You have a lot of devices in parallel to achieve the rating you probably only have once in the whole life, whole lifetime of the vehicle. And all the devices will then introduce additional losses. Uh, this is a very uh, special for the switch mode electronics or power electronics because when we have more switches, uh, the loss is not really linear to the uh, to the conduction area of that because we have switching loss. So you have more devices at light load, the switching loss will be very big and that will be uh, dominant. So when we have more devices, your efficiency at light load or partial load will be massively compromised. So that's something we want to solve. But to solve this problem, we need to reduce the switching energy or the switching loss. And that's something we 
called so-called the voltage zero voltage switch or DVS. Uh, DVS has been used in power trying for for a while, and it's a very interesting technique. And I would like to firstly kind of give you some very very simple way to show how we achieve the DVS to uh, reduce the switching energy. So let's say we have a half bridge, and the current is flowing. Uh, at this moment from the lower side to the load, okay? And then we want to switch on the higher side device and switching off the lower side device. So they need to switch complementary, otherwise short circuit the whole way DC. So the high device from open circuit to, 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 to closed circuit and the voltage between of the high side from the full VDC to zero. So for that moment, you will have the voltage uh, uh, from high DC to low voltage, and then current start from zero to low current. So this kind of transition gives the loss, this whole so-called hard switch. Soft switching is, we still have the same thing. Let's say before we're switching on the high side device, we already have a existing current goes uh, via this device body diode. So that current is already there, but in the opposite direction, because that is conducting current, even there's some voltage drop on this uh, body dial, but it's much less than the whole VDC. So you can consider the voltage of the device before that switch on is already zero. So that means you actually have zero voltage when you start switching on the device and then the load current will later come through this MOSFET. And that is zero voltage times the change of current, zero times anything is zero. So you have soft switching, so the switching on loss can be reduced. So, so that is possibly the simplest way to uh, explain this, but it's actually the whole process is more complicated than this. But the whole idea is can we create a opposite direction of current before we switch that device so we can achieve the switching, zero volt switching. And we can because Bear in mind, we have a lot of devices in parallel. They are there. So we have the facility of doing that. The way is how we do that, can we do a proper control? Conventional paralleling is like this two devices in parallel, for example. Uh, two devices completely controlled at the same uh, control signal. So they are considered as the same device. They're always synchronized, okay? and you synchronize them together means that there's no control between that two. They are treated as the uh, same device. But now, if we have a lower granularity of control, we can access individual devices, which, which we should be able to because they are same devices. And between those uh, uh, parallel devices, we give a little inductor in between. So they can be decoupled before they are solidly connected together, but now they are decoupled. So that means they do not need to be all the time synchronized. So they, you can create a little uh, interval uh, between that two points of voltage. And with this uh, very small inductance, we can recreate some circulating current between those parallel devices. And that could possibly offer us some soft switching. Remember I mentioned, we want to have some offset current before we switching on that device. And that current can be created by those parallel devices if we can control them properly. Um, before we go to the details, I just say we can we can use this arrangement of the connection for DC DC converter, it can also be the DC to AC traction inverter. So then we developed a number of different sub-switching techniques of this parallel devices. The first one is also the simplest one, so-called desynchronization. So as I mentioned, before that two always switching together, solid connected, synchronized. So that means these two lower devices, for example, if we look at the two lower devices, the all time switching together, so there's no differences. And you will say when you're switching that lower devices, the voltage start from high voltage, and then we'll have a switching loss here. So that's hard switching. But now, these lower devices, we can have two controlled in a desynchronized fashion. And then we create this a little current. If you look at the current, it actually goes to zero. That is a circulating between that two parallel devices. And then we can have one of that two lower devices, for example, switching at zero voltage, 
when we have this switching on, you see the voltage is, is zero, that means we achieve zero switching. And this little delay can be calculated and uh, you know, depends on the time of the devices we use and also can be quite robust because you can have this zero voltage slightly earlier if you want. Uh, it will not affect too much about the whole system and it will still uh, offer the soft switch. So it can be quite robust the control we have. And we built a uh, gallium nitride device based uh, DC to DC converter just to see what we uh, can achieve. And the uh, small inductor in between that two is only 3.3 .3 microhenries that can be even further reduced. So you can consider that newly added devices uh, trivial. Um, then we say uh, for this uh, uh, six kilowatt uh, converter at light load in particular, uh, the two uh, in parallel in unsynchronous mode has a uh, considerable increase of the efficiency. So that's the first success with a little desynchronization, little delay. And then we have something a little bit more complex. So I apologize, my apologize for this uh, uh, very complicated circuit, but I will, I will explain this uh, in a very simple way. So this one we call the quadrilateral current mode or QCM. So why we call that? Before we have a little delay between two devices, but now we have little delay, but two different delays between all of the devices. And that will result a current looks like a quadrilateral shape. If you see this current, a quadrilateral shape, and the other current is other quadrilateral shape. So these two currents are the current of individual legs. They will not, they will not be seen by the outside because the outside is the sum of that current, that's load current. So load current is still constant current as you, as you wish, but between that, internal two parallel legs, the current will be very different. And that will give you the negative current here, as you say, to, to offer this soft switching of switching on. And that has proved very successful. So we built the other four kilowatt gallium nitride device based converter just to see whether we can achieve this. But one thing I have to mention here is if you look at this quadrilateral current of individual leg is higher so our load current. So that, that shows a trade-off. Even we have switching loads eliminated or almost eliminated because of the soft switching, the uh, conduction loss will be increased because the arm's current value is higher than the load current. But that won't be a problem because if we have a higher load, we just switch back to synchronous mode. So before there's a little delay, you see here it's not synchronized, but this for the partial or light load, we'll have a higher load, the power increase, the load increase, we just synchronize them together similarly. And then we can balance the whole efficiency. And that proves very, very well. So we, we built a four kilowatt DC DC converter, and we see before 2.5, uh, just, just higher than half of the whole load. Uh, the QCM we have has a significant increase of efficiency. And then it will converge with the synchronized mode. And later it will convert the same point, but it's fine. So we can switch to the synchronous mode similarly, depends on the loading. So the overall efficiency can be increased. So that's our soft switch number two, the quadrilateral current mode. And then we have our soft switch number three, uh, semi-bridge uh, desynchronization, which is a, a bit variant of the desynchronization method. Uh, but the hardware is different. So rather than we have the full half bridge, we have a semi bridge, i.e. we have half of this bridge is uh, transistor and, and the other is only dialed. So that can save the cost, also quite popular topology using DC DC converter. And still the partial load, you can see the current of each leg is very different, uh, but some of them is still load current. And that gives us this uh, this ability to soft switch some devices so we can reduce switching loss. And we have a heavy load, then they go to the synchronized, uh, uh, conventional synchronized, and then with the uh, loss can be also further reduced. And we built this, but this time we use a silicon carbide device, uh, a, a six kilowatt DC-DC converter, 
And as you can say, uh, it converts something about half of the whole load. And then we can switch back to the synchronous mode to all, all the time keep the higher efficiency of the whole, uh, doing the whole uh, mission profile. Then the number four is to keep, increase the complexity of the soft switching is to have one parallel leg only to do the assistancy of soft switching, uh, which is so-called thrust and uh, commutation pole uh, that can create a uh, kind of rust and pole current when we switch this device uh, with interest. So we can have the uh, uh, zero switching uh, and that will depends on different loads. So uh, this, the width of this little pulse will be adjusted to, uh, to facilitate that soft switching. Um, uh, so the whole thing here we want to say is we can do uh, more intelligent control with the already existing facility, which is the parallel devices. You have the parallel devices in the converter anyway. And then without any other hardware, uh, we can reduce the uh, switching loss uh, massively. And we also uh, have done the um, uh, experimental validation of this, uh, the rest of the computation pole uh, soft switching technique. And as you can also see, a significant increase of efficiency at partial load. So, so that is the uh, switching loss benefit from this decoupled uh, from this uh, decoupled connection with this inductor. And when we switch them to the synchronous mode, when we have higher load, it also brings some ad uh, additional benefit, which is the current sharing can be properly uh, balanced. Uh, without that inductor, uh, even with synchronize them together, the current won't share very well. I mean, because the, 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 the intrinsic string inductance will be different, so you have some uh, uh, some some missharing, but with this small decoupling inductor, even at a synchronous mode, sharing current can be uh, very good. So that's one additional benefit. So with all of this uh, new uh, uh, intelligent switching uh, techniques, we would like to apply them into a DC to AC inverter. So I call back the 180 kilowatt inverter we have built. So we'll apply this. Uh, all the techniques uh, uh, coordinately uh, to achieve the higher efficiency. Uh, we have not finished that test. So this is a, the, the simulation result this has already been very, uh, very convincing, very good. So we still use that NEDC profile, which is 20 minutes. And to see the whole, during the whole NEDC profile, if we compare with IGBTs, the silicon carbide is, uh, it is the solid uh, uh, orange uh, line is, Hard switching without intelligent control has only a significant uh, improvement of efficiency uh, over the silicon IGBT. But if we have this uh, uh, intelligent soft switching, we can have uh, one to two percent in average uh, added uh, efficiency to silicon carbide devices. So that's some other uh, uh, additional benefit, as we can see. Right, so that's uh, just enough about electric vehicles. And a vehicle, we talk about not only cars, can be vessels, can be ships. Uh, so transport electrification, not only for the ground vehicle, can be uh, marine, can be uh, ships. So uh, this, is a, this is a very interesting one. And uh, it's a company uh, actually sponsored us some projects. Uh, it's the UCICS. Um, they built the uh, uh, full electrical system of this very ship. Uh, they, they took the picture last month. Uh, that is the largest full electrical ship in the whole planet. Uh, 1,300 passengers on board. Well, when, when that is fully operational, and the uh, 7.5 megawatt hour capacity. So, in context to vehicles, that is 150 Tesla Model 3 on board. Uh, a lot of uh, battery. So. Uh, we actually also have been involved a bit on this project, very interesting. Uh, but the actual work I'm talking to talk not for that shape is the other case that we have worked with ICS is uh, the DC network for the hybrid electric ship. So uh, full electrical battery uh, shape is still quite rare, but most of the time we use the uh, diesel engine to generate electrical power and have electrical propulsion drives. 
So this actually has have been used has, has been used for, for a while and has been very successful. But one issue is they use AC network. So the whole AC network is built from the ferromagnetic uh, components like transformers and bus bars. And they use a lot of steel and copper and not very good for control. But we can replace them as the full DC bus bar. So then all this power, no matter what the frequency and the voltage from the digital generator can be first rectified to DC. And then even the hotel load, even the, 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 the other uh, communication computing load can use the DC power directly uh, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for, for their demand and the proportion also from the DC bus. So that will give you more controllability uh, and this more semiconductor power system rather than uh, a high steel and the copper will use more silicon. And this has actually has proved very successful. Uh, the build uh, one uh, research vessel is the first one in the whole world uh, use the DC bus that we also been involved with the project. And um, as you can see, uh, the switchboard transformers uh, in the AC bus bar were all eliminated for the DC bus bar. So you save a lot of well, money and also more important mass and the footprint can be reduced. So, you know, at, anything on board needs to be as compact as possible. The total weight can be half of the AC system. And the, uh, the cost now, the overall cost is still slightly higher because we use more silicon, but silicon from sand and copper and steel from commodities. So their price is pretty saturated, but silicon can be all the way down. So we know in the future that can be even cheaper. And more importantly, not only the capital cost, the maintenance or the operational cost will be reduced because before AC system, you can only run the diesel generator at fixed frequency. So some at light load, sometimes you will have light load and very poor fuel consumption uh, uh, efficiency and high emission, by the way. Uh, so we can then, if we use DC system, we can adjust our diesel generator speed to always open as the optimal uh, point to have higher efficiency. Uh, and then that can save the fuel. And that's, very, that's particularly uh, beneficial for like vessels because you, you need these vessels for dynamic positioning or for example, like docking or maneuver. Those things normally light load. So you don't want them to run at a high speed. The fuel consumption will be very high. And uh, very interesting, we had a sea trail of this ship uh, which was uh, in the late night, um, uh, 2018 to early uh, 2019, um, about two months voyage from the southeast coast of China to the Mariana Trench. Um, and we have the data of this DC bus to show how, benefit we can how much benefit we can have. And overall, there are nearly 10% fuel saving. And, I can tell it can be even more because this captain of this vessel was a bit cautious with the sea trail. So uh, he, he didn't really all the time put the economical mode, uh, but still we save about 10% of uh, fuel. So that has been uh, uh, highly reported by the society is uh, to create a lot more opportunities and the, uh, uh, it can benefit the industry uh, very much. Right, so I think I've been run out of time, so uh, I try to accelerate my uh, uh, this, 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 this last one third of the whole presentation. Uh, so inductive power transfer provides power uh, EV charging is also something we have been doing uh, quite a lot. Um, so that was sponsored by uh, APSRSA. We work on some uh, high power uh, power transfer techniques, especially we use uh, a different uh, the uh, um, um, uh, materials. So uh, we use this, something called non-crystalline alloy, which is different to the conventional high frequency material uh, ferrite. Uh, ferrite are very fragile, they are brittle, they are ceramic compound, but non-crystalline alloys are metallic uh, materials, so uh, they are more robust. And also some other good properties like higher saturation point, fired only about 0.45 tesla, uh, nanocrystalline can go higher. So that means you can have higher power for the same size. And also uh, technically can be lower uh, losses if you design properly, but I'll talk about that later. It really depends on the design. And the permeability is also higher, which can also bring some benefits. So the nanocrystalline core we use 
possibly the first one in the whole world we introduced this new material for such applications. And we have uh, a accompanying uh, here is a Hitachi Maito to customize this special magnetic core for us because this one used nanocrystalline alloy ribbon, which is a um, very thin uh, 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 metallic ribbon. Uh, so you can just want this core by using the ribbon. So basically that can be a non-stop ribbon, uh, monolithic material and stack them together into a core. So the length of this can be, can be very large. This is one advantage than the fire. The fire is a ceramic, so they cannot make a very big uh, footprint because they're very brittle. So um, the other thing for the nanocrystal is that is something very different to uh, the conventional uh, uh, thyroid because this is not homogeneous. So it's very anastropic uh, properties, the permeability and conductivity oh, will, will change at different directions. So uh, my student Daniel, uh, he actually finished already, uh, that done a great job on this to build, to establish the whole framework of analyzing this whole nanocrystalline uh, materials for uh, wireless power transfer. So we built an analytical model and that's also validated by experiment and also numerical model uh, to find an element uh, method to see the distribution of the field and to uh, calculate the loss of the whole, uh, uh, the whole path. And then we uh, also uh, have the whole design procedure of of using nanocrystalline material for the high power inductive power transfer IPT. So uh, thanks to that analytical model we have, we can then use computer to design all different parameters uh, by defining, first defining all the variables we can have, which is normally the uh, dimension and the spacing between cores, number of turns of the coil, you know, such design parameters. And we can let the computer to run that with each set of parameters we can see the power, the efficiency, the saturation, all these uh, critical, uh, uh, critical uh, 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 values. Then we can have this multi-object, ob object, sorry, multi-objective optimization to find the very best uh, 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 parameters for design, and which end up with this dimension uh, where we have this whole magnetic core here with any, without any spacing and the lens is also defined here. So to make comparison with the conventional one, we also uh, uh, bought some thyroid cores uh, like this commercial, uh, commercial available one and also some customized one. So this is possibly the largest footprint of the thyroid core they can make uh, because it's very brittle, and you can see the area gap in between. But for nano crystalline, because this is alloy uh, a ribbon uh, um, uh, kind of type of the material, so you can make this lens very long and make no air gap in between, so the efficiency can increase. And we built this. We also have a look at the actual stacking of this little ribbon. So. Very, every, every ribbon is very thin, about 18 micrometer, and they need to be properly insulated between each other. So originally we used some other companies to make this uh, insulation not very good, uh, but Hitachi Metal actually did a very good job. So you can see they can be segregated very well between the ribbons so that can reduce the EG current loss. And this is a test rig we built, which is a size just, just larger than two A4 page, so uh, two A4 papers, is the, the footprint of the whole, whole, whole thing. And later I'll show you, we actually run this for 20 kilowatt for 100 millimeter air gap. So we designed this as the rating for 11 kilowatt. And we compared that nano crystal with the FT3M as noted here to other ferret magnetic material. And very, very surprisingly good, the efficiency is about 2% higher. That actually, better than our expectation. Uh, but also one very interesting thing is the loss distribution of the nanocrystalline is very different to the ferret because we have more ED current loss. You see the green one doesn't show in the ferret because ferret is a very good uh, kind of insulating material. So uh, the, the, the ED current loss is very low. Uh, but the other advantage we have for nanocrystalline is the power can be even higher. That is a design for 11 kilowatt, but we have to reach to 20 kilowatt. 
without any, without any sign of uh, uh, saturation. But for the same of the uh, N87 fiber material, as you can see, just above 15 kilowatts for the same site, it starts saturating. So the, so, the, so the current will become distorted rather than sine sodium because of saturation uh, in core here. Uh, for the nano crystalline, it can still go up. We didn't go any further because our test uh, facility has some constraint, but we believe that can be even higher because there's no any signal uh, of saturation. That is all sent to the high saturation point of nano crystalline material. We also look at the thermal performance uh, because this metallic material is very good at thermal conductivity. So the temperature at the equilibrium is lower than the farad at the same power. And also the, the temperature, uh, the heat is properly uh, or like better distributed along this core, not like the farad. You can see some hot spot uh, at the edge because too many air gaps in between of, of the small farad tiles. Uh, lastly, I would like also mention this. A lot of people say, oh, where is power transfer? That could be quite uh, dangerous for human beings. Uh, not really. Uh, so if you talk about the actual standards for the leakage flux density, uh, uh, those numbers you can see here. And we actually say, let's make it more extreme. Someone has a pacemaker, so it can be more sensitive to EMI. And the, uh, uh, that is 15 micro uh, Tesla. But if we test that with reasonable dis distance, I mean, no one can, when we're charging that, no one can, you know, just under the vehicle and next to that, that'd be silly, right? So with, with a reasonable distance, you see that even much lower than the pacemaker's standards. And further, uh, nano questioning have even lower leakage flux density. So it is safe. Uh, if someone says it's not safe, they just worry about new technology, but I can tell that's safe. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, I, I, I try to make them very quick. So the other work we have done is to reduce some compensation capacitors for the wireless power transfer, uh, where we embedded that capacitor within the coil. So the coil itself has the uh, uh, parasitic capacitor to make the self resonance. So that can save a lot of uh, space of components. And we did that uh, for the medium power transform. So now high power, we talk about high power is normally tens of kilowatt. Medium power is, is something between 100 watts to three kilowatt. Uh, and that is also quite uh, uh, now quite popular for some uh, like ro uh, robot or some drone power charging. And that needs something extremely small and light. So we have this embedded call you to reduce the, to completely eliminate the uh, compensation capacitors to reduce the size and weight. So really last part, sorry for this overrun, <laughs> is about the uh, uh, data center, which is also sponsored by the CAPE members. So I really appreciate their sponsorship. So we started this uh, about two years ago and uh, we actually started learning a lot for data center. So why we see that's very important issue. So this is a data center, you know, this is a data center with all the servers. In China only, the data center consume electricity equivalent to three, three gold dam generation combined. Uh, so that's a lot of power. So uh, those things now they consume a lot, a lot of electricity, they consume more energy than the aviation, whole aviation industry. So to save energy, save electricity, high efficiency of data center have a lot of uh, impacts. And what are data centers, what the power supply for them? So we have the data center server racks and they receive higher voltage, normally from the grid at AC and have several conversion to a high voltage DC. And then this DC voltage need to be uh, uh, also transmitted to each of the server blade or the server uh, drawers, but that normally have a lower voltage, conversionally 12 volt. Uh, but now we talk about 48 volt can be better. And that one will then convert it to even lower voltage to the actual load, which is our, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, we call XPU, it can be GPU, can be CPU, can be ASIC, can be FPGA, can be a different a high computing uh, uh, circuit, uh, integrated circuit. So if you look at this uh, uh, GPU board, uh, a part of the GPU, GPU in the middle and some memories on the side, the most 
recognizable things are the power supplies. So about like uh, 30 to 40% of footprint of the board is actually occupied by power supplies, by power electronics uh, work, what we're doing. So you can see the significance. Um, and why we see 48 uh, power supply, XPO power supply is better. So before we use 12 volt, we know same power, lower voltage, higher current and transmission uh, loss can be very high. Uh, but to, to use that also need to make it very close to the GPU because the output of the 12 volt is one volt, even lower voltage, so the current can be even higher. So you try to make them as close as possible. But the GPU, uh, normally the, the footprint of the board is very small, so there's not much space we can use for the power supply. So that means the power density or the current density of any power supply for such application need to be very high. You have very, very small space for you to put out power supplies. And we say, let's use some 48 power supplies instead of 12 volt as the input. 48 is still safe voltage, uh, also quite commonly used in telecom, and they so can um, uh, reduce uh, the conduction loss uh, a lot. So it would be basically be one over 16 of the conduction loss of the 12 volt system. But then we do need a converter to reduce that to further down to 12 volt to be compatible with conventional 12 to 1 volt DC converters. And we build some new topologies, which you can see very small, but very high power. This little small converter can convert from 48 volt to 12 volt at 600 watt. Uh, so that's very high power density. And I'm not going to tell too much details about this work because still something have not been published yet, but uh, just to give you more appreciation about the whole importance of the work. And lastly, I would thank to all my team, my postdoc, my PhD students, they have done fantastic work. Without their help, I'll be nothing. So thank, thank, thank them very much. And all of our work uh, can be, uh, all, all, all papers can be downloaded from my uh, group website. So uh, if you're interested, Feel free to look at our website and thank you very much indeed. Hopefully this not this has not disappointed you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuten. I think that's an amazing talk and uh, such a wide range of uh, exciting work. Thank you. I think we all very much will wait for this wireless charging system, which I think will be very popular. Now, I think the talk is now open to questions. So you can unmute yourself if you want to ask questions, or you can send your message through the chat. No, I just have a, one uh, question. I think you touched some part of it. You showed the electric vehicles mm -hmm. from the AC uh, generator to the convert to DC storage, then convert it back to AC to the motor driving the car. Yeah, that's the process. Yeah. But uh, is anybody working on DC motors so you can save the sector stage DC to AC converter? Oh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, very interesting question. Uh, the, uh... You know, some old tram, uh, I think the oldest one used the DC motor is the, 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 the tram in San Francisco. They use DC motors. Uh, DC motors do have some advantages, for example, uh, well, I mean, if you don't have converters, it's, it's okay, but it's quite lossy, but it's okay. You can still use that. And also uh, the torque from DC motor can be even higher. But the problem is that DC motor needs the electrical brush and sleep ring, and they, uh, um, they, 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 they can wear out very quickly. So that's why uh, modern, uh, modern time people uh, prefer uh, AC motors better. DC motors are very easy to control, but uh, as I said, they have the electrical brush and the sleep ring, uh, which can cause some uh, reliability issues. But, uh, you know, they, they, uh, uh, back to about 100 years ago, uh, San Francisco, they, they have uh, tram system originally used DC, DC motors. And even some, uh, I think London have some uh, uh, metro trains, not all of them also use DC motors, still use DC motors. Thank you very much. Nianjian, yeah, you have a question. 
Uh, yes, thank you very much for the talk. Um, this is not in my field and I'm a material scientist. So I saw that you mentioned about Gaia naturally from the very beginning about the material it needs to create the um, switch. Yeah. So is, is that like the, is the thickness related to the band type or something else with the physical properties? So, so uh, there's something out of very, very power something like that. So, so um, it, what we say here is like, it's not only for the higher holdout, holdout voltage, it's also, uh, uh, a, I, mean, I mean, you could use less of the material for higher switching speed. Uh, but this actually shows the, the breakdown voltage of such uh, wideband gap devices is higher. So to break, to hold the same voltage, you use less materials. But it's not only for that uh, smaller uh, conduction resistance uh, and, and the higher switching speed. It also depends on the structure of the, the device. For, for MOSFET, that's quite straightforward. But for the other structure, it can be a bit different. So this is only just to kind of here, I just try to uh, uh, visualize the, the difference of web and gap devices compared with the conventional uh, silicon or uh, gallium asana uh, 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 materials in terms of the uh, uh, physical properties. But in power electronics, in what we interest, we actually more interested in the conduction loss and the switching loss, and maybe also the thermal conductivity to have better cooling. Okay. I hope yeah, that yeah, when I saw this, I was just thinking, uh, I know that it's still, um, well, it still hasn't been done yet for doping sapphire, yeah. but I thought, what thickness would be there if we can put sapphire over there? <laughs> right, and, 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 and the other thing, for example, like uh, gallium nitride devices, we, I mean, the most commercial ones that use gallium nitride on silicon, so not really pure gallium nitride on gallium nitride. So uh, you can argue like that's not pure white band gap devices. And also some, some devices use the cascode uh, structure, they, they have uh, uh, a silicon and silicon carbide combined. So um, it's still quite a long way to go, but I, th I think uh, power semiconductor scientists are working very hard on this. For us, we do more applications. So we consider their uh, electrical properties and how we utilize such electrical properties into the power converters. Uh, we control them properly, we use better uh, or different topologies and different passive components to assist in their performance. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Hello, is this Shemin Huang? I am not uh, in the world of Cambridge. I'm from Gehan, CAP group. I, a very good lecture, uh, uh, Doc, Doc, Doc Noon. I, I'd like to ask a question about the, the travel. Uh, will be the travel will be a bit more complicated if you, uh, the hub bridge travel, uh, the hub bridge architecture, if you, uh, you said this um, time difference, uh, delete, one of them is delete. So I think that probably the, 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 the the control and uh, the driver will be more complicated, is it? That's, that's a very good question. That's actually a common question from our papers reviewers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you very much. So uh, yes, I admit that we have one trade-off is if you have lower granularity of control, so to access a uh, lower level of devices, uh, the trade-off is have to have more drivers uh, and uh, probably higher, uh, uh, higher computing uh, uh, strength processors. Um, so yes, that, that is a trade-off, but the way we think about this is uh, integrated circuit has uh, progressed uh, very well in the last decades, well, last several decades. So now uh, more channels, uh, 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 gate drivers are very common. You, you know, we, we talked something about like, I have seen some single chip 32 PWM channels uh, still in a very small footprint and affordable price. So uh, to have higher computing uh, 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 utilities in the power converters, it's not only the trend, it's already it has already happened, you know, it's, 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 it's still keep progressing. So, so we think we increase the demand of computing or demand of gate drive a bit more 
to exchange much more benefits on uh, efficiency and the loss reduction. I think that's the right direction. So yes, I agree with you. We will have more uh, uh, gay drives. Uh, but the other thing I also want to say here is that uh, when you have many of the parallel devices, you don't really need to access each, each of them. Um, for example, like this, we have four in parallel, but we actually have two in one group, like one pair, and then the other two for the other pair. So then you can have like the balanced point between number of gate drives and the uh, sub-switching performance you want to achieve. So uh, this is quite, quite, quite a flexibility here. Uh, and in terms of the, uh, the actual, uh, you mentioned the, the control logic, we put some delays, but as I mentioned, the delay itself, uh, let's give you an example like the, the very, very beginning one, the very uh, uh, the simplest one, the delay itself has quite ro high robustness because it's more like threshold. Once you're over the threshold, uh, it's substitution will be guaranteed. So it's not like you precisely control the very interval of switching on and off, otherwise you will lose substitution. It's not like that, it's more like you go over the threshold, then it will be guaranteed uh, substitution. So that means the control has some delays or you know, some intrinsic uh, 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 synchronization, uh, synchronization that's still acceptable. Uh, and it will not affect the whole waveform anyway. So, so yeah, so that's something we have proved that, you know, we, we, we shift from synchronization to unsynchronization, different strategies, even, even with in one sign sodium, we can do that. We have not, we, and I didn't put anything here because I have not published that yet, but uh, that proof, you can smoothly, seamlessly change them uh, in between and to achieve the high performance. And also, uh, at the moment, uh, you are going to use uh, uh, one floating supply for the high side, uh, two two fights, or or just uh, just uh, or use two two individually. Uh, uh, the, the high side floating floating supply for the for, for driver the the two two. Uh, uh, oh, right. fight. Okay, so um, we so so for this one, we still use two separate. Uh, uh, isolated DC, a small DC DC converter for the high side, um, uh, so for the for the individual high side device or individual pairs of the uh, uh, the, the high side. Uh, why does it can be combined? That's something uh, we have discussed, and that uh, internally that, that that could be possible uh, depending on which uh, uh, intelligent soft switching we use. Uh, but but for the test purposes, we still use that. But you know those things are very cheap, and now they can make these things very very small. Um, so I don't think that'll be a big issue anyway. And also, I I'm not sure. I just I just I I, I think maybe if if I drive a high side driver, if it's uh, uh, a slow slow increase driver, I mean I. Uh, Possibly, you just uh, because uh, the, the fast driver, uh, uh, the, the parallel inductor could be caused uh, a ring of, of voltage. If if the driver slow down, just slowly increase, mm. uh, is it possible the same effect as you use? Uh, That's very good. Yeah, very good one. So soft switching give us one other advantage is we can deliberately slow down the device because. The already zero voltage switching, so it doesn't matter you're switching that very fast anyway, right? So uh, we can deliberately slow down that to avoid any rings or uh, overshoot, uh, which caused by the high DI or DK. So that's, that is definitely something uh, very interesting. And the other interesting we actually, we're working on that is to, uh, because we can slow down that. So uh, one particular problem for power trains is called voltage reflection. When you have long cable in the voltage can be reflected, uh, you know, as a transmission line, you have to reflect the voltage, which can uh, uh, can break the uh, insulation of the machine's windings. And that is normally caused by the high switching speed. But using soft switching, we can deliberately slow down that without uh, a compromise of switching loss because we soft switching already, the switching loss already zero, nearly zero. So definitely, that's uh, that's something we also look at. That. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any further questions? If not, 
let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, Penn. That's a fantastic talk. And sure. thank you everybody for taking part in it and uh, for stay to the very last of it. I know it's uh, longer than usual, but thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Darby. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye. The, this uh, lecture is now concluded. Thank you. Thank bye bye. You. Thank you. Bye bye.